One of the things I love is that in this time where we see God moving and working, one of the things we're seeing is even people who have been believers for a long, long time have this longing uh, to recommit, to, to do spiritual seeking and grow deeper in their relationship with the Lord. And I don't know why I flipped open to Isaiah. We're not preaching out of Isaiah today. I do have it bookmarked. There we go. So I'm still with two phones. Um, my plan Monday was to go get them fixed. Those plans got altered a little bit and uh, haven't really been in town since. So let me put that on silent before it makes a loud noise. I want to just tell you, I, I love the Word of God. Before I was a believer, I didn't, of course, naturally, I didn't really understand. Uh, a lot of what I did was I would just read Scripture at face value and say, okay. And when it would come to a passage like this, I guess I'd just be confused. Not real sure what that means. I, I mean, when it comes to salt and light, I, I kind of know what those are and, and what those do a little bit. But I wouldn't have been able to, to put it in the proper context. And I'll tell you that I certainly wouldn't have been able to spend at literal hours diving and researching and studying one verse. One verse. And now I've done that with several verses or several one verses over and over again. Matthew 5.13 was the one that you see on the screen. That's the one that I, I'm, I mean, four or five hours just looking up the history of salt and, and the, the different nuances that this uh, scripture could have meant to the original audience. And because we know that the correct interpretation of scripture is who it was actually written or spoken to. But even with this one verse, I, I think there were like six or seven different contextual theories that actually would have been appropriate. Now, I've got good news for you. You're not going to get a deep dive in the lesson into all six or seven of those. We're not going to do that. Uh, what I do know is that last week's message kind of took shape of, we talked about holy discontent, and we talked about a proper posture of the heart when it comes to who we are, who God is, and I don't know, and I'm not going to ask this to everybody in the room. Everybody's not a pastor that's ever preached a sermon. But I know Jeff and Shannon are here, so I don't know if y'all have run into this yet. But it's, it's almost like what I thought were going to be two standalone sermons could almost be put together in a series on a correct posture. And so we're, we're going to see that theme come back up uh, as we kind of walk through these four verses here. But I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 5, uh, and I'll be in the English Standard Version. Verses 13 through 16. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and, and just anoint your people, God, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to understand your message for us this morning. God, that Jesus would be high and lifted up, and it's in his mighty and precious name that we pray. Amen. Anyone in here a fan of Hell's Kitchen? I got some. I, see, I didn't know if anybody would really like that show. I like to cook. I am not a chef, but I am a fan of chefs. Uh, I enjoy cooking. I am a big Gordon Ramsay fan, uh, sometime to my mom's frustration, because while she's char-grilling steaks, I ask her to set me one aside so I can pan-sear it, and I know that's, that's incredibly rude. If it wasn't my parents, I, I wouldn't do that to anybody else. But, like... His recipe, love it, and, and I'm just weird like that. So, I have watched every single episode that you can possibly stream of Hell's Kitchen. It's 20 seasons. The, first, the, the latest one is not on Amazon Prime yet, so I can't stream it just yet. But when it comes out, I'll binge watch it. Healthily, though, not unhealthily. But, like, I, I've gone over a span of two years and watched 
hours and hours and hours of this show. I love it. I love the cooking. I love watching them struggle to compete in this competition while they're sleep deprived and exhausted. But one of the things that I have watched make over and over and over is a risotto or risotto or he says it with a nice British accent that I'm not going to emulate. I have never had one. I have never cooked one. I don't even know the proper way to pronounce it. But I have watched this staple of an appetizer be made literally thousands of times. And just for those that don't know the show, uh, typically on night one, appetizers is not where you want to be because that will get you sent home quickly if you can't cook a risotto, risotto, whatever. You get the point. But it's the dish that I see that so it, everything goes up to what he calls the pass and he, he inspects everything to make sure it's good enough to send out to the customer. And so he'll take a spoon and he taste tests as he plates and that kind of a thing. And it's the number one dish that gets sent back over and over and over and he says, because it's not seasoned. He'll either say something like, this is bland, or um, it needs seasoning, or he'll just straight up say, more salt. And so as I've watched hundreds of episodes and watched this dish be made thousands of times, the one thing I'm picking up is, okay, risotto needs salt. Got it. If, if it's bland, add salt. You need to have a little bit of that salty taste in there. Um, 20 seasons over the course of two years, and this week, I learned that I was wrong. That's not the point. Salt has many purposes. We've already mentioned there, there are different that would be appropriate nuances for those that heard Jesus say these words. Salt preserves. I'm sure you've heard a sermon uh, from this scripture talking about the preservative properties of salt and how important that would have been. Um, apparently, salt in just the right amount was actually used in fertilizer. So some people theorize that when he says you're the salt of the earth, that when it's in that proper amount and goes into the ground, it helps things grow. Of course, you got to be real careful with that because too much and it kills everything. And that's why actually when salt lost its flavor, it would still kill things. They very carefully put it in the street so that it would be trampled underfoot. Certainly we know we add salt to food. It's on all the tables and then in 2023, I, is salt good or bad this year? I, I don't know. I don't even remember what it was last year. It changes from time to time. But many of you may be like me uh, and have no idea what adding salt to food actually does. Now, we all know what it does to food if we add too much, right? And then we could throw it away and start over. Salt actually enhances the flavors of the dish or the food that you're putting it on. If, if food has too much salt, we call it salty, we throw it away unless we can add more to it to dilute the salt. But if food has too little salt, we call it bland. I hated broccoli when I was a kid. I don't know if it was just because it was green. I don't know if it was a texture thing. I don't know. I just didn't like it. I love it now, but I still don't want it without salt on it, and I like pepper on it. But salt makes it not so bland. It brings out and enhances the flavor of the broccoli. There are other spices, if we go back to the risotto, there are other spices already in the dish. It's not that salt is the only thing they ever put in this rice dish, and when they bring it up there, he says, there's not enough salt, go add some more salt. I want it to be saltier. That's not the point. The salt brings out the many spices and flavors that are already present in the dish. Salt enhances sweetness, but dissolves and dispels bitterness. Anybody ever heard that if you've got a cup of coffee and it's bitter, they tell you to sprinkle some salt in there? Now, too much, it's going to taste like you made your coffee with water from the Gulf of Mexico, right? That's not what we want. But just the right amount, you're not going to taste the salt. It's not going to make your coffee salty, but it's going to get rid of the bitter taste. Salt is a key element, but when used correctly, it won't be the star player. I want to say that again, and I want to let it sit just a second because we're going to come back to this. Salt is a key element, but when used correctly, it will not be the star player. And then we have Jesus says, okay, but if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? Throw it out. Now, Jesus is not talking about what we've got, like the salt plant down the road with our pure sodium chloride, NaCl, no impurities in it whatsoever. That's, that's not what Jesus is talking about. That in itself is actually a pretty stable compound that doesn't just 
randomly decide I'm not going to be salty anymore, right? That, that doesn't really happen. But in many of the places from which they got their salt in ancient days, it was not necessarily down in the mine where it would be pure, but it was in little veins of the ground. And when they would go get it, it, was, it, it there would be little earthly impurities mixed in with the salt that could cause the salt to lose its flavor. But also the salt that was exposed to the elements, particularly the rain, would not be salty. There's a book called The Land and the Book. And forgive me, the guy, I'm sure the guy that wrote it has long been dead, but I don't remember his name off the top of my head. But it's phenomenal when you're trying to put verses, particularly when Jesus speaks in parabolic language, like we've kind of got here, we're not literal salt, so he's not speaking literally. But when he's using language like this, the audience would understand it, but we weren't there thousands of years ago, so we have to dig a little bit. So what he's done is he's actually gone to Israel, and he's tracked through all of these. And in this particular instance, he said he went and found some and broke it off in one of these veins in the earth. And he said the salt that was on the outside that had been exposed to the elements, he said when he tasted it, there was no flavor. So, but he dug a little bit more, and once he got to the salt that was connected more to the rock that had not been exposed, not had those impurities, it was still salty. So this is kind of what the context is. Your, your table salt and your shaker is not just randomly going to expire after about two years and say, I'm not salty anymore. But when we set it in the proper context that the audience would have understood, they would get it. And then again, like I told you, the next verse, he says it's cast out to be trampled underfoot. They were very careful with it because, again, too much. I think the book said you're not going to find a man randomly casting the, the flavorless salt out into his field. They would very carefully take it to the street and let it be trampled underfoot because in a lot of cases it was chunky enough to be gravel. And so they would pack it down and then, it, I mean, two for one, I guess the grass, well, you wouldn't have weeds in your driveway. I don't know. But... Jesus says, then, then we switch gears from salt to light. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. I mean, big kind of no-duh point in the sermon. Light illuminates. And I'm just going to tell you, there are some youth in here that are going to roll their eyes because they're probably sick and tired of me teaching and reminding them of this. But what, guys? Darkness doesn't exist. Darkness does not exist. Scientifically, darkness is the absence of light. At its very nature, by God's design, that's why darkness can never prevail against the light. Because darkness is only the absence of light. doesn't matter how small of a light source you have, the darkness cannot overcome it. John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, as I try to flip there very quickly. John writes, and he says, speaking of Jesus, and he says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then I'm going to give you uh, verse 9, if you were following and want to drop down. It says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Kind of like the last thing we said about salt. You can bookmark that one. We're, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. And then the last one I'll give you, John chapter 12, verse 46. Jesus speaking, he says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. The darkness cannot overcome the light. There is never any fear, never any doubt that someday the darkness may get so dark that it will win. It is scientifically impossible. Light always dispels darkness. The darkness. I, personally, I, I, don't, I don't know what your opinions are, but uh, not to get political, but I hope the government does not ban TikTok. Because I get so many just good sermon illustrations from that. I don't know what I'd do if I had to go a week without mentioning a TikTok, okay? So, and this was actually yesterday morning. Uh, we woke up and were kind of just laying in bed trying to, very groggy, trying to get going. And, and I was just mindlessly scrolling through TikTok. And this, this girl pops up and she's got like a quarter of a million followers. Like 741,000 people follow her. I know telling how many views, millions of likes, all that. Clearly she could call herself an influencer, right? Well, she is a former worship leader 
a pastor's kid who uh, is deconstructing. And if you're unfamiliar with that, this is people who just uh, question everything they believe. And, and to be fair, a lot of that stems from church hurt. Uh, let's, let's face it, the church is full of broken, imperfect people, and we don't always get it right, and sometimes we absolutely get it wrong. And so I, I don't say this to say that there's anything wrong with deconstructing or wrong with what she's doing, but there was a video that popped up, and she was kind of listing her reasons about why she didn't go to church anymore. And in her caption, see, I, I'll go down rabbit holes. I, I'm always going to read the caption. I'll dive into the comments and then chase the videos that are in the comment Anyway. In her caption, she says this to, to end it. She says, finally decided it wasn't for me. And the Holy Spirit just kind of went, you know, gave me a thumb in the ribs. And I was like, no, but that's it. She's right. It's not for you. It's not for me either. Spoiler alert, if you're here and a believer, it's not for you. Let me explain just a little bit. Have you ever seasoned your salt with salt? You, you see people say, mm, that salt, I don't know about it. Let me, let me add some more salt. That doesn't make any sense. You ever shined a flashlight at the sun? That doesn't make any sense. I'll, I've told you about it, the, the one that, it's not coveting yet. I'm not to there. I could go buy one if I really wanted it. I got my dad one for Christmas, and it's bright. Still not going to shine it at the sun. It's, there's no point. Let's bring it closer to home. I, I'll give you an example. The talented, amazing rotation of people that you see up here on Sunday mornings, they're not playing for you. They don't, they don't know. About, like Steve doesn't text me on Monday morning or text Ricky on Monday morning asking what the pastor thought about the worship. I mean, do we want to offer our best? Sure. But it's not an offering to us. It's not an offering to you. It's an offering to God. We're singing to an audience of one. I can promise you, as someone who has sat behind the drums many a times, and I don't, I'm not like the rest of the talented ones that get to rotate on different instruments. I wasn't that good. But some of the best worship for me happened in rehearsal, and there wasn't anybody in the room but us. Because it's always an audience of one. It's not for, I, I didn't take notes and listen to the music saying, I hope I do a good job for the congregation. That's by far missing the point. Because if I come with that attitude and that posture, as you begin to see where the theme comes back in, then I'm hoping that you're really, if I'm honest, praising me, not praising God. I hope that you're coming, man, the praise team did good this morning. And they do. They do great every morning. They're awesome. But they, they don't do it for us to tell them they're awesome. They do it to lead us, to help us posture ourselves as we offer of ourselves to a holy God. I hear so many people say, and it frustrates me to no end, I, I, don't, I don't need to go to church. I connect better with God. Fill in the blank. For a lot of guys, it's in a deer stand. I'll just be honest with you. I connect best with God when I'm on, on a tractor mowing hay. But you, you know where you're going to find me on Sunday morning? Not just because God called me to preach. I was here before that. I'm going to be here. It's not about me. Yeah, it would be great. That would be a great excuse to say, I don't need church because I connect better with God here if it was about me. It's not about me. It's not about you. I'll tell you, there's two people that it's about. The first one is Jesus Christ. The only reason we're here is because the work that he has done on our behalf. We were the one. He went and found us and has brought us into the fold. It's no longer about me. My, my praise and worship, the object of that is Jesus. The reason I'm here on Sunday mornings is Jesus. And I hope other people come to know him too. The second person it's about is the next one. Now, there's two candles up here. That's because when Colby and Tyler got baptized, that, this is on me, it's my fault. We're, we're getting used to this, right? I was supposed to have them come up here and light it, and I didn't do that. But when we put out the candles, the, we did the hundred candles, and that was great in that season. But, but now we're using this as just the reminder for the next one. 
Because the goal is to light it, give it to them at the end of the service, and then we put a brand new candle that represents the next one. We can't come in with this posture of, okay, well, what am I going to get today? Are we going to be blessed by gathering as a body? Absolutely. Are we going to be blessed by coming into the presence of God and singing to Him our praises? Absolutely. The verse we read earlier said God dwells in the presence of the praise of His people. We're going to be blessed because God is here. It's just a byproduct. But the point is not for me. It's for Jesus and it's for the next one. That's why it drives me nuts, guys, when I hear people that say, well, I just up and left my church and nobody called me. Well, I hope it's because they're out busy chasing people that weren't in the fold and decided to leave. I hope they're focused on the next one. I just want to let you know, the Bible says the people that will come to know Jesus and inherit eternal life is small. Jesus calls it a remnant. That means the majority will not. So that means our, the majority of our efforts better not be making sure people here are satisfied that the songs we're singing aren't so new that people don't know them and not so old that people know them without the screens. I mean, I hope you wore your steel toe boots today, I guess. I don't know, but I'm just telling you, is, this is what God has put on my heart. It's, it's not about me. That's why I love when the seats are full, but I don't, I don't care when they're not. Well, isn't that... Scary to hear the pastor say. But I'll just be honest with you. Well, I've told you before, crowds fluctuate. That's not the point. My point is the one. Look, I promise you, before I knew Jesus, I, I would sit back there and I would think, man, why can't we have sausage balls every Sunday? <laughs> and there's still, I, I believe there might be a place to have that conversation. But we need to prioritize it, right? The number one focus is I'm coming to praise Jesus. Number two, is I'm going to be salt and light. I'm not adding salt to salt, and I'm not shining a flashlight at the sun. I'm going to go pour it out where it's needed. I'm going to be the salt of the earth, and I'm going to go out into all the nations and make disciples of Jesus Christ because Christ has said, I am the salt of the earth. Which, whichever nuance you want to pick, preserve, flavor, whatever, Christ says that we're to impact the world. He said, you are the light of the world. Darkness cannot Stand against the light. Go back and let's just read the last verse or two again. He says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. And, and I've switched to the NIV. I'm sorry. I'm not switching back on my phone. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? That they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father. Jesus explains. It's not about you. Yes, you are the salt and you are the light, but it's not about you. It's about others. This is why, and James iterates this in the book of James. It's not that we do good works to be saved. It's that we do good works because we are saved. And he says the same thing, that others will see that you have faith because of your deeds. The point is that because of what we do and who we are, which is the whole point of our theme of focus this year, is to get back to what we're supposed to be or who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing, is so that others would see and benefit. Everyone sees the light that's on the hill. The lampstands that were lit in the temple were high enough to cast light over the wall so that the city received the light from the temple. It's not about us. If, if you're an unbeliever here this morning, let me tell you, it is about you. Because Jesus told us to go reach you, to make disciples. We pray. Every day there are members of our church that pray that people who don't know Jesus come to know him, that have an encounter with him, with the risen Savior. But first and foremost, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about singing praises to the one who is worthy because of who he is and what he's done for us. So church, the challenge is very much like it was last week. Let's have the correct posture, but then let's go out and do something with it. Let's be salt and light to a world that needs us as Christ's representatives. Amen? Amen.